Over the past few years, the crypto community has seen tons of cases where coins were stolen, losing people tons of money and bringing the security of exchanges or wallets into question, or in some cases, eradicating them entirely. These problems almost never have anything to do with the currencies themselves, but are usually a product of poor management, bad third-party software, or simply carelessness with regard to maintaining private keys. Unfortunately, when these stories hit the mainstream, people often interpret them as issues with the underlying protocol instead of irresponsible users. A common reason cited for people staying away from cryptocurrencies is that they're worried their coins could be stolen to no fault of their own. The technology is relatively new, so these misconceptions aren't completely unjustified, but I think a few simple examples will point out how strange they are. So imagine you're at an airport. You've just arrived in Europe and you need to exchange your home currency for euros. So you go over to the nearest currency exchange kiosk, you give them some of your money from home, and in return they give you the equivalent in euros. Now instead of putting the money in your pocket, you decide to leave it on the counter of the kiosk because you're hungry and get distracted by another kiosk selling Cinnabons. So you walk over and eat an airport Cinnabon and come back to the currency exchange kiosk 10 minutes later. You find that your money is gone, probably because someone took it. It doesn't really matter if it was the exchange or a random passerby, you're unlikely to get your money back. Instead of learning to be more careful with your money and not leave it in random places, imagine trying to claim the euro was hacked. Yes, that's right. Instead of taking responsibility for the money, claiming that an entire global currency was hacked. So here's another example. Imagine you're at a restaurant and you need to use the bathroom, but you decide to leave your wallet on the table instead of bringing it with you. You come back to find that somebody had stolen 10 US dollars from you in that time, and your response is claiming that actually the reason why you lost your money is because the US dollar was hacked. In a third scenario, imagine that you decided the best way to manage your passwords is to write them on sticky notes that you keep on your desk in your office. One day you have a friend at your house who wanders into your office and notices your Facebook password on a sticky on your desk. He continues to log into your account and make some posts pretending that he's you. Upon noticing this, your response is to claim that Facebook has been hacked. So obviously, all of these scenarios are completely ridiculous, and nobody would take any of these claims seriously. Nonetheless, almost every single cryptocurrency hacking case falls directly into one of these three categories. But because the technology is so unfamiliar to most, a lot of people give some of these claims more credit than they deserve. With that being said, the real question is, has Bitcoin ever been hacked? I'm not talking about exchanges, wallets, or irresponsible users. I'm referring to the network itself. Has Bitcoin's blockchain ever been corrupted? You might be surprised to learn that the answer is once, sort of, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So we all know that Bitcoin's blockchain is guarded by proof of work and no single entity has enough computing power to gain control of the network. So how could it be possible that Bitcoin was ever hacked? So while cryptographically Bitcoin's blockchain is 100% secure, that doesn't mean that you can't still trick a majority of its users. I'll go through a simple example of what I mean by this. So imagine you're taking a math test and you want to create some kind of distributed system for grading it correctly. The test is fair and all the questions are reasonable, but you want to be sure that the grading of the test is equally fair. Let's say you hand it out to a bunch of people who will use a calculator to grade it and they get some kind of reward for grading it correctly, so all of them will try to. Now there are millions of people doing this, and all of them are using different calculators and have a good understanding of how the math works. This is similar to the current state of Bitcoin, but it wasn't always this way. Let's go back in time for a moment. Way back, I'm talking pre-2017 bubble, pre-2013 bubble, and even prior to the 2011 bubble, all the way back in 2010, when Bitcoin was just one year old and there was a very tiny community. Instead of having a giant, diverse community of people, there were just a few and they were all using the same tools. In our math test example, this would be similar to having maybe just a few graders and they're all using the same calculator. Now, even if the test is equally as fair and mathematically correct, that doesn't mean that you can't exploit a bug in the calculator. Let's imagine that you know of a specific calculator that calculates two plus two as being equal to five. If there are millions of people all using different calculators, the handful with the broken calculator won't make a significant difference. You won't be able to redefine math but if there are just a few people and they're all using the calculator with the bug, this could generate some serious issues. This is exactly what happened to Bitcoin in 2010. You might think that my example with the math test and the calculators is oversimplifying the problem, and you'd probably rather see me just jump straight into the technical details. But I chose this example for a reason, and I think you'll be surprised to find that the exploit really is as simple as I'm making it out to be. So look at these two numbers on your screen. If I asked you to add them together, what do you think the result would be? Obviously, I wouldn't expect you to be able to do this in your head, but I would expect you to be able to tell me that this answer is definitely incorrect. There's no way you're going to add up two large positive numbers and end up with a negative result. If you could identify this, then you've already outsmarted the entire community of early Bitcoin adapters in 2010 because they fell for this simple trap. 
Just because someone has a PhD in cryptography doesn't make them impervious to blunders from Computer Science 101. As you'll see, a basic understanding of data types would have prevented this kind of problem from ever happening. Any type of data that exists on a computer, whether it's an image, audio, or even just a number, has to be represented by only zeros and ones at the lowest level. A common way of representing integers in languages such as C or C++ is the signed 64-bit integer. All three parts that make up this name are important. Signed, meaning it could be positive or negative. 64-bit, meaning it takes up exactly 64 bits in memory. There are certain advantages in computational speed and memory knowing that something will be a fixed size. And finally, integer, meaning just that, no fractions or decimals. So what you're seeing in front of you is 64 zeros, which is the signed 64-bit integer representation of the number zero, as you could imagine. And if you just count up in binary, you get the representation of that number. So for example, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, so on and so forth. You get the idea. If you know how to count with binary, I'm sure this makes sense to you. But the question is, what happens when you get really big numbers, like numbers that might take up the entire remainder of memory? For example, this big number is represented by these 64 bits. And I can safely increment by one to get this number as well. But what happens if I were to increment by one again here? You might think that there's no problem because I still have one additional zero to work with at the front of the number. But this is exactly where the problem lies, since we need to use these 64 bits to represent both positive and negative numbers, not just positive ones. Therefore, any number that begins with a one is actually a negative number. For anyone who hasn't looked closely at data types, this concept might not make much sense, but I'm sure this is familiar to many of you. Two's complement is used to calculate the magnitude of the negative number, but any number starting with a one truly is negative. I don't want to spend too much time talking about binary arithmetic, but if any of this confuses you, just look up adding and subtracting in binary. So incrementing here would actually give us the negative number with the largest magnitude. And incrementing again would have our negative magnitude reduced by one, just as you would expect with adding one. This can continue all the way down to negative one, which is represented by all ones, as you could imagine, and you would seamlessly transition back to zero if you incremented again. So you might be wondering how any of this pertains to the Bitcoin exploit, but it's essentially all you need to know. What you're looking at here is the plain text representation of the faulty transaction that made it onto the blockchain. If you look in the out portion of the transaction, you'll notice those two familiar large numbers next to value, suspiciously close to the number we talked about earlier. You might be confused since these look like floating point numbers, but miners prefer to actually represent these numbers as 64-bit integers to avoid messy rounding errors with floating point representations. Besides, Bitcoin defines the smallest representational unit of the currency to be 1 100 millionth of a Bitcoin, often referred to as a Satoshi for short. To avoid decimals in general, miners will typically do math in Satoshis instead of Bitcoin. Since miners added these numbers together and ended up with a relatively small negative number once converted back to Bitcoin, this one under the radar is simply a standard tip for miners. The only issue is this subsequently issued 180 billion Bitcoin into existence, where only 21 million should ever exist. So if we look at the blockchain, we'll see that 74637 was fine, and 74638 is our bad block. That is the one that wrongly encased the fraudulent transaction. The big question is, what happens from here? Won't every block going forward now have 180 billion Bitcoin too many, and the community will forever lose trust in the blockchain? Well, not exactly. The blockchain is designed to gracefully handle these kinds of things, and the unlikely chance that they'll happen. This issue was discovered in a matter of hours, and the code repository being used by most miners was updated with the patch. Just as with anyone who was correctly performing calculations, this patch would cause miners to add those numbers in the transaction correctly and reject the fraudulent block as a result. Since this would imply that block 74637 was now the newest block, miners continued building off of this one again as normal. By the time block 74691 was reached, the correct chain had outpaced the fraudulent one, fully burying the issue. The only possible side effects this created was failure to include legitimate transactions that occurred after this block in the bad chain. This is pretty unlikely though, as there were only 53 bad blocks, which equates to less than 9 hours, assuming about 10 minutes per block. In 2010, Bitcoin wasn't even trading against any fiat currencies yet, so its value was essentially zero. And even if there were serious transactions during that 9 hour period, no fraudulent Bitcoin would have been gained or lost. The transaction would simply have failed and could have been retried once the chain was correct again. So the question remains, has Bitcoin ever been hacked? What do you guys think? One could argue that fraudulent blocks are attempted and rejected by the network all the time, and this was nothing more than an instance of a fraudulent block that was especially well disguised. 
But then again, you could argue that anything capable of fooling the entire network down the wrong chain reflects badly on the network itself. So yeah, I'll basically leave it at that. If you enjoyed the video, remember to like and share, especially if you know someone with misconceptions about the history of Bitcoin hacks. If you have any questions or opinions on the topic, feel free to leave a comment. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.